Well, I think the, the agricultural story of the valley can be told in two basic steps. The first one is as the early Atlantic Ocean is opening up, the continent is, is stretching. Large, deep valleys are formed during this process called rift valleys, of which the Connecticut is one of a number of these that are spread across the northeastern United States. Only the second event uh, that's to follow is in fairly recent geological history, and that was primarily through the formation of Glacial Lake Hitchcock, which deposited a, a set of sediments that provide this substrate for rich agricultural soils. But this was a, a place rich in thousands of years of, of Native American op occupation by all sorts of of, of different groups. So it's important to acknowledge that they were here first and there was a, a series of rich resources here. Some people think that a land-grant university is one where the government bought the land and gave it to the university. What really happened was, and this was in the middle of the Civil War, 1863, where the Morrill Act was passed, establishing the whole system of land-grant colleges and universities across the country. Justin Morrill, who was a senator from Vermont, and Abe Lincoln got together and said, we've got to provide for college education in the area of the sciences, engineering, and military training. What they did was they identified federal land and gave it to the states, and the states then sold it off and took the proceeds from that to create one or more land-grant institutions. And so the land was bought here, there were six farms. These were already by then well known as, you know, probably the broadest extent of fine agricultural land in, in Massachusetts, if not in one of the largest in the Northeast. And that's where Olmsted's activities came in. He was hired by the trustees to do a, a plan for the whole college. His idea was to sort of create what it looked like would be a, a New England village associated with agriculture and the like. The trustees turned it down and they said, no, we're going to put the buildings over here. So one of the most famous landscape architects got the <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. But one thing he did have in his plan is that you should create a pond down here because there was just a stream running through. Early in that process, Frank Waugh came on the campus. He was hired by the president to establish what's now the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning. The campus pond, it, you know, it starts out as this bucolic symbol of, a, of, of the campus and the campus center. This pond was a great skating pond and the hockey team trained on it and the like. But it was a gathering place and it also was the site for what was an annual rope pull across the pond. The campus pond is an impoundment that collects a lot of stormwater from the surrounding Amherst community, which is now not a sleepy little college town any longer, but a fairly large-ish, medium-sized urban area. Just after the turn of the century, you can see the, you know, the rich agricultural development here, but you can already see the the university turning its eye towards other you know, academic pursuits. Achieving a designation of state college was a recognition that this is the way you're going. I came here as an undergraduate in 51. 5,000 students on the campus. It was small, but growing fast. The large-scale concrete buildings of the post-war era, of the 1960s and 70s principally, they manifest the transformation of the university from a college to a university, from an agricultural school to a research university. Modernism was the expression of the Commonwealth's vision for what it could provide its students and its future generations. Modernism brought a cultural change and a great deal of idealism and hope that new technologies such as steel and glass and concrete could provide the means to build more facilities. There were more people who wanted to get a college education but couldn't afford to go to Harvard and Tufts and BU and, and, and the like. I think the GI Bill then brought the idea of access to public education and democracy. Because they were on the GI loan, they were able to get essentially federal assistance to pay their way through college. 
And in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the GI Bill brought so many students to the campus wanting to build a better future. There were many, many more students here at the university starting in the 1950s. I think that the enrollment expanded from like 4,000, just 4,000 students to over 10,000 by the mid-1960s. Today we're up to 25,000 and we keep growing. They built large-scale buildings to accommodate this increased enrollment, but to also express a larger and more ambitious agenda. Some were built in a more traditional way, emulating colonial or Georgian architecture, and some were built in a more modern fashion. The campus of the 1950s is quite eclectic. There's a range of different types of styles. They brought in a landscape architect, Hideo Sasaki, of Sasaki Associates from Boston. He created a master plan for the whole campus. The Sasaki plan of 1963 brought about these amazing architectural expression from Marcel Breuer bringing the campus center to Kevin Roche and the Fine Arts Center as an expression of the arts and performance to Southwest being one of the top residential areas that really experimented from a social perspective of how to build density in a rural area and how to provide a living environment for students so that they can be in community and work in an urban environment. A new ring road was created around the campus. A mall was created at the front of the campus to serve as kind of a front yard and a formal front door. The campus center, for example, was on a podium that opened up the view and started a conversation with the Fine Arts Center across the pond. The Fine Arts Center would not just be a building for theater, studio, art, and music for the campus, it would be for the whole community. It would be a very inclusive place. The facade of the library is made of brick instead of the limestone that it was originally conceived as because brick allowed it to be a taller building. It made the campus brand itself as an innovator in library facilities. The, uh, the rumor that there were bricks falling off that building is just simply a rumor. Not a single brick ever fell. I think the myth was that it was sinking and that it had been designed without keeping in mind the weight of the books and that the bricks were falling. And all of them are myths. And they actually did put fencing around there because what was happening was the bricks were chipping because they failed to put the right kind of material in the expansion joints. And in fact, for the last 40 years, we have never had anything more than small chips of the brick fall off of the facade. The library has adapted to four different generations of students, has done so many changes from the initial time that it was built as a graduate research library to what it became very soon thereafter, which was a library to serve all of the campus community. It's probably one of the few places that you can go and see American architecture from 1723 to today's modern. It's the physical evidence of the campus succeeding in its ambitions. The ambitions have always preceded the buildings. These buildings are large-scale, rugged, and sturdy. They're workhorses. They are capable of change, of improvement. They can meet our future needs. Well, the plan is actually already in line with us not purchasing any new property. So it's all about smart development on existing property, building density, respecting our cultural heritage in terms of open space and ecosystems. From the point of view of sustainability goals, I think the plan is very supportive of more thoughtful renovation of existing buildings. The Student Union is one of the buildings that was listed. And so they had to file notice with the Mass Historical Commission. This building is the first of the modern building expression on campus. And I think more importantly, it was the first investment that students made in their co-curricular activities. And because of that, it needs to be retained. The front of it was the place where many student protests and many student events took place. And so we have respect for our legacy. There were reflecting pools in front of the Fine Arts Center, and they were beautiful, they were exquisite. But buildings change, times change. So at one point, it was decided to dismantle the reflecting pools. They were hard to maintain in a cold climate. 
and they were repurposed. A garden was built on the site of one of them. A parking lot that accommodates the needs of people with disabilities was built on the other one as well. So they were changed for good reasons. They are really beautiful buildings. If we find technical ways to clean them and repair them, I think they will serve us for another 30, 40, 50, or 100 years for that matter. They were built to last. Many of them were built in an era when there was unlimited energy. In our future, we may not have an unlimited energy. The driving force should be energy conservation. We've invested a lot in our central heating plant, which is an award-winning plant. So we need to transition over time and to build a network of facilities that hopefully continue to be more and more driven by renewable power. So what's happening today is when you see solar panels across parking lots, which is a great place for solar panels. One example is when I first came here almost two decades ago, no one thought about using solar panels on buildings. In fact, there was a proposal that I remember to put solar panels on the roof of the Fine Arts Center. It was not considered feasible. But just a few years ago, solar panels were built on the roof of that building. As the campus expanded once again in the 60s and has recently been retrofitted with, with a considerable amount of stormwater infrastructure, primarily with Southwest and the Southwest redevelopment. There you get a vision of how stormwater is, can be managed in a modern and sustainable and ecologically functional way. It's just almost as if in rapid succession we see the stormwater rain gardens and natural native plantings around the John Oliver design building. I think students are why we're here. Students always lead us. In some ways, they come, they learn, they live here, they learn from the faculty, but ultimately they challenge us. I have seen many generations of students push the sustainability rope on campus, and we have gotten as far as we have, primarily because of their leadership and advocacy. I think whenever you regard this campus and this agricultural site, it's good that you look you look at the past, the geologic history, and kind of the reasons for why the valley is shaped like it is. When you move around here, I've, I found it extraordinarily enjoyable to, to think about this, because I, th I think it, it gives you a sharper, to use perhaps an overused phrase, a sharper sense of place, that, that it's a unique agricultural area. The college had a long agricultural history, and then it has changed culturally in a series of cycles. And, and I think that, that its, its location and, and part of this process of its history just lends some sort of undefinable quality to this institution. I mean, I've been fortunate. I've, I've been able to teach and research at many fine institutions around the United States, but I don't think there's ever one that I've really loved more than this one. And, and it was a kind of a growing appreciation that developed over the years. And I really think the place of where we're at here at the university has a lot to do with that.